It's all very well for a bunch of scientists to sit and speculate about the nature of electricity and magnetism, to design experiments and publish findings. But nothing really drives home a theory quite like designing machines based on it. Now that we've had a detailed look at the theory behind electromagnetism and how it developed, let's have a little fun with it. No other theoretical development in the history of science has had as much of an impact on technology as electromagnetism had. I'm able to stand here in Bangalore at the Vishveshwaraya Museum and speak to you and not worry about which part of the world you may be in. Perhaps the biggest impact of the development of electromagnetic theory has been the growth in the technology of communication. In the mid-18th century, experiments with electricity were being performed all over the place. People soon realized that electricity propagated at an incredible speed and could be used for communication. The electric telegraph was the first device that utilized electricity to communicate. It was pretty simple when it was invented by Samuel Morse. It began a revolution that continues today, and it all began with a few simple dots and dashes. In order to communicate, we need a language. When the telegraph was invented, it consisted of two devices, a transmitter and a receiver, connected by a wire. It could only transmit two kinds of electric pulses, a short pulse, called a dot, and a long pulse, called a dash. By mixing these in various combinations, Morse created a way of encoding letters and numbers using only these pulses. This was the famous Morse code. Today, technology is so much a part of all of our lives that most of us don't even know what a telegraph looks like. But it was a revolutionary device in many ways. There is a famous story of how John Towle, an Englishman, was on the run for murder. He had committed a murder in the morning in Slough, a town in South England. After that, he boarded a train to London, not realizing that someone in Slough knew of the murder and had run to the train station asking that the police in London be notified. A message was sent via the electric telegraph to Paddington, a station in London, because of which Towel was apprehended and later hanged. He was later known as the man hanged by the telegraph. The invention of the telephone, a device we now take for granted, is one of the most significant breakthroughs in the history of science. Many people attempted to build a working telephone, but with those seven words, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you, Alexander Graham Bell succeeded. Bell's work built on the theoretical developments of many scientists before him. The telephone is a sophisticated version of something many of us played with as children. The principle behind the transmission of sound in a telephone wire is similar to this. In the cup and string phone, sound waves were transmitted as mechanical disturbances along a string. But inside a telephone, the bulk of the work is done inside the handset. Sound waves are first converted into electricity and then transmitted. The bottom of the handset contains a microphone. It has a thin circular piece of metal. This piece of metal is called a diaphragm and it is so thin that even vibrations made in air caused by sound waves are enough to make it vibrate. A small distance behind that, with nothing but air in between, is a piece of plastic known as an electrode, which is short for electricity plus magnet. This is connected to an electric circuit through a copper wire. The electric circuit creates a constant flow of electricity to the copper wire, which creates an electric field around the electrode. When the diaphragm vibrates due to a sound wave, it disrupts the electric field around the electrode. This changes the strength of the electric current in the circuit. This varying current is amplified before being transmitted via telephone lines to the desired recipient. But this is only half the job. The other half is done at the top of the handset, where the electric signal needs to be converted back into a sound wave. This speaker section of the phone consists of a magnet separated by a small distance from another diaphragm. 
this diaphragm contains a copper coil within it. Why is this needed? Let's have a look. The transmitted electric current of varying intensity reaches the coil in the center of the diaphragm. A magnetic field is set up around the diaphragm. This field vibrates with the same frequency as the current intensity, causing the entire diaphragm to vibrate. This, in turn, makes the air molecules around it vibrate, and this is what we hear as sound. A simple idea, yes, but it took a genius to figure it out. Of course, once we figured out how to get our voices transmitted across long distances, the next step was to figure out how to get a video of ourselves transmitted across long distances. Hence the invention of the video phone. But why stop there? Why not combine speaking on the phone with a video call? We can do that now thanks to the 3G spectrum and the rapid internet connections that it allows us. Video calling is now available to all of us really easily just through our mobile phones. Video phones allow for two-way communication but they are not nearly as popular as a device that allows one-way communication, the television. Television stations allow audio and video to be beamed wirelessly across the world with the help of satellites. I don't know how many of us actually take the time to sit back and marvel at the level of technological advancement it takes to be able to watch the Discovery Channel or the History Channel in the comfort of our own homes. To begin with, the audio and video signals have to be separated at the source and transmitted independently. Once this is done, they are beamed up to a special kind of satellite called a geosynchronous satellite. As the name suggests, this kind of satellite orbits the Earth at the same speed as the Earth's rotation about its axis, which means that it appears stationary relative to the Earth's surface. The signal, which reaches the satellite, is then beamed back to the Earth's surface and is received by an antenna called a microwave antenna. This antenna is usually housed in the center of a dish known as a parabolic dish. This is done to amplify the relatively weak incoming signal from the satellite by concentrating it from a relatively large area. The signal is then transmitted to our televisions where the audio and video are synchronized and a television program can be watched. As direct-to-home television has become more popular, the sight of parabolic dishes on the roofs of houses has become very common. It allows the broadcaster to reach the audiences directly and it allows viewers the choice of a multitude of different watching channels. Time time. I'm Absolutely magnificent. Oh, that would be the big story, of course, Indo Park, a foreign ministry of level talks. From movies and, and entertainment to, to sport to Parkinson. daily news and weather, it's all available on satellite television. Speaking of weather, we can see at the museum how a weather report is shot and telecast. It's hard to imagine at first, but the weatherman stands in front of a blue screen on which he cannot see anything. The image of the map is then digitally imposed on it by a computer. With a little practice, anybody could be a weatherman. The large amounts of data on weather can be stored in a computer hard drive or on a magnetic tape to be decoded whenever required. So we've looked at a couple of major inventions which we cannot live without today. They both work on principles of electricity, both current and static. Let us now have a look at a device that exploits certain properties of magnets, the computer hard drive. It is actually just a sophisticated version of the cassette tape. Let's have a look at magnetic recording using a cassette tape as an example. Why do we use a cassette tape? Well, it's the easiest to break with a hammer. A cassette consists of a long and thin plastic tape which is coated with an iron oxide powder. Remember how the iron filings outline the magnetic field lines near a bar magnet? Well, the iron oxide on the tape behaves in a similar way. To see the video that's on the tape, we need to decode the information on it. We do that by inserting it into a player that's connected to a television. Inside the player, The machine that reads the information on the tape is called a tape head. 
It works as both an encoder and a decoder. To record, the tape, which is coated in iron oxide, passes by the head. The head is an electromagnet connected to a circuit with a small gap. Much like the telephone, the circuit is designed to convert incoming sound into a varying electric current. This varying current changes the magnetic field around the tape as the tape continuously moves past the head. As the magnetic field changes, the positioning of the iron oxide particles changes, but in a specific way. The particles remain in that pattern permanently once they are out of the strong magnetic field of the tape head. In order to listen to the sound encoded on the tape, the reverse process takes place. The magnetized tape creates a small but varying magnetic field around the head, which is amplified by the circuit and converted into sound. The fact that information is stored by magnetic particles means that strong magnetic fields can affect or even erase information stored. Another place where the same principle is used is a tiny magnetic strip at the back of credit and debit cards. It also contains a coating of iron oxide. The motion of swiping it through a reader creates a tiny magnetic field whose orientation and strength both depend on the iron oxide particles on the strip. Now each card is made differently so that the iron oxide particles on each strip are different from all other cards. This is how a sort of signature can be created and it is very hard to duplicate. The use of magnets to store and interpret data goes way back to the birth of the computer. Here at the Electrotechnic wing of the museum, we see a life-size model of the IBM 1401. Computers sure have come a long way since then, haven't they? This property of magnets, that their orientation in space is a way of encoding information, has found a very important use in medicine too. The MRI, or Magnetic Resonance Imaging Machine. To understand how an MRI manages to create virtual slices, let's do an MRI on an MRI. Let's slice it open. The most important part is the magnet itself. It has to generate a large and stable magnetic field which does not vary along the length of the patient. The magnet itself is a large electromagnet which consists of coils through which electricity is passed. The constant flow of electrons creates a magnetic field. More than half the weight of a human being is due to water molecules. Each hydrogen atom in the body whether present in a water molecule or a fat molecule, rotates about an axis which is pointed in some direction, as if it were a spinning top. When there is no magnetic field present, the hydrogen atoms rotate about any axis. The axis itself acts like a tiny bar magnet. When it is exposed to a magnetic field, it tends to align itself in the direction of the field, either pointing along the field or against the field. When the magnetic field is still on, a radio pulse is emitted at a specific frequency. At this frequency, it causes all the unmatched hydrogen atoms to flip and line up with the others. When the radio pulse is switched off, these formerly unmatched hydrogen atoms return to spinning about the unmatched axis. In doing so, they emit energy, which can be picked up by a detector. Using a mathematical formula called a Fourier transform, these pulses of energy are converted into an image, and this image is seen as an MRI image. But wait, we've forgotten something very important. Thomas Edison and the light bulb. In 1879, just three years after the invention of one revolutionary device, the telephone, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Although its working is not based on the unification of electricity and magnetism, its invention came after Maxwell's work. So how does a light bulb work? In a light bulb, a coiled filament of high resistance is encased in a glass bulb. The electrons in the filament keep hitting atoms, causing them to vibrate. This vibration makes the electrons jump to a higher level. When they return to the lower level, they release energy. The filament in a light bulb is made of tungsten, which releases energy as visible light when heated to
to about 2200 degrees Celsius. Being surrounded by highly evolved technology like LED televisions and high-speed computers, it is easy to forget the long and hard journey that it took to get us to this point. At the museum, there are many displays that remind us of this journey. From transistors and integrated chips to cathode ray tubes, the history of everyday devices is on display right here. There are many displays here at the museum dedicated to demonstrating the use of power at home. But perhaps the most exciting is the smart room. The smart room gives us a quick and interesting glimpse into homes of the future where advanced technology takes us to a new level of comfort and safety. The room is programmed to be unlocked by an authorized fingerprint which eliminates the need for a key. The act of opening the door sets off an automated switch which controls the lights in the ceiling. Are you tired of turning a room upside down looking for a remote control? The smart room takes care of that too. The television here is activated by sensors in the sofa. This means that it comes on as soon as you sit down. The same goes for the music player which is similarly activated by the adjacent sofa. As if that isn't enough, the mirror also doubles as a television when someone sits in front of it, so you don't have to miss even a second of your favorite television show. The child's room at the back is kept under constant surveillance with the help of a baby monitor which beams the signal to a screen. Take a look around, there are many more clever innovations at work in the smart room. That's quite a familiar feeling, isn't it? Being blinded by a camera flash? Have you ever wondered how such a bright light is created by simply pressing a button? See, on its own, a normal camera battery is not capable of producing a high enough voltage to make such a bright flash. But a device does exist that can store charge to a high enough voltage that when discharged quickly, it can produce enough power to create such a bright flash. This is a capacitor. A circuit with a capacitor in it consists of two parts, a charging part and a discharging part. When a capacitor is being charged, it is connected directly to a battery. Notice how the bulb in between grows dimmer as the capacitor gets higher and higher charge. Also, the voltage across the capacitor goes all the way up to 15 volts, even though it's only being charged by a 12 volt battery. This is what provides the higher voltage which is needed to create a bright camera flash. When the capacitor is being discharged, charge flows out of it and into the circuit. Initially, it's at a very high voltage, which makes the bulb glow brightly. But as the voltage across the capacitor goes down, as the capacitor discharges, the bulb also glows less brightly. Piezoelectricity is electricity that's generated by certain materials that can convert mechanical stress into electricity. As we see here, the LED glows when a mechanical stress is exerted on a piezoelectric material, causing an increase in voltage as well. A similar thing happens in a lighter. Notice how a spark is generated when a force is applied on it. As far as wires go, optical fibers are the most advanced form of signal transfer. What happens is that a signal is converted into light, which then, through total internal reflection, proceeds to the other end of the optical fiber. It travels much faster than an ordinary signal, because light travels at the incredible speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. There are also lots of interactive exhibits here at the museum. For example, the virtual EMF, where you can build your own circuit. You can try out different combinations of batteries, bulbs, ammeters and voltmeters in various kinds of circuits without having to go through the trouble of actually building a real circuit. There's no danger of overheating or short circuits here. 
the software is also constantly updated, incorporating more and more complicated circuits. For the more competitive visitor to the museum, there is an interactive quiz table. Up to four people can battle it out at the same time. The quiz tests your knowledge of the entire gallery through a series of tricky multiple choice questions. If you've been paying close attention, you stand a good chance of being crowned the champion of the Electrotechnic Gallery. We now fast forward to today's world. A world of computers, air travel, satellite communication. A world without electromagnetism is inconceivable. Even as we sit down, we are being bombarded by electromagnetic rays from wireless routers or Bluetooth devices, cell phone towers or even sunlight. The possibilities are endless and exciting. We've been given some incredible tools to work with. Michael Faraday best captured the spirit when he said, nothing is too wonderful to be true if it be consistent with the laws of nature.